Good morning again. We're in a series called Vision and Values, and we're talking about where we see ourselves heading in years to come and how we, we go about getting there. And so we've been talking about some things that are important to us. And last week, hospitality. We think that because everyone is important to God, that everyone should be welcome here. How many think that's a really good idea? And by everyone, yeah, that, that's a good place for... <clears throat> by everyone, I don't just mean the people who are like us, or even the people who we like. We want everyone to experience the grace of God for themselves, and so they're welcome here. There's another kind of guiding value for us, and it has to do with excellence. And I know as soon as I say that word, some people have strong reactions to it. There's a great deal of misunderstanding about the concept of excellence. Some people feel very burdened down by it, maybe even uh, paralyzed, as though nothing that they ever do is good enough. A spirit of excellence doesn't burden you. A spirit, a spirit of excellence actually frees you. Excellence is not the same as perfection. Perfectionism will absolutely paralyze you. That's true. Excellence will actually animate and motivate you. Also true. Excellence doesn't motivate you to be better than someone else. Mot uh, excellence motivates you to be better for someone else. That's the difference. Some people pursue getting better just because they want to beat other people at whatever the game is. That's not really a spirit of excellence. That's the spirit of competition. But the idea of being better for others, that's where excellence starts working its way into our hearts. So I want to give us a definition, a working definition of excellence as to how we think about it here. And here it is. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. Would everyone just say that out loud and together with me? Do the best you can with what you have where you are. There's always going to be reasons that we are limited. We don't have unlimited resources, unlimited energy, unlimited strength, unlimited friends, unlimited time. We often feel paralyzed by those limitations. You might not be able to do everything that you want to do, but that doesn't mean that you can't do some things that really matter. And so excellence helps us sort that out. And there'll always be more reasons to not do things than to do them. But we don't just make decisions based on which category has the most reasons. Our fear can find a lot of reasons for a lot of things. So we're going to look at a story this morning, and the context is kind of interesting. It's in the old book of the Bible. If you've ever heard the phrase, the, the writing on the wall, how many have ever heard that phrase? Oh, the writing's on the wall. It comes out of this Bible story. And uh, what happens is there's a king, his name is Belshazzar, and uh, the kingdom is Babylon, and, uh, and he has gathered a thousand nobles for a huge party. And uh, while they're there, I mean, these are, these are wealthy individuals, these are educated individuals, these are prominent people in the kingdom, and they're having this huge banquet, and, and they're drinking wine, and they decide, actually it's the king who decides, Belshazzar, that they should take some of the artifacts and goblets out of the, the place that they have stored them. They originally took them from the temple in Israel and to bring those in and use those in their drinking games. And so they decide to do that. And while this is happening, all of a sudden, a hand appears with fingers and it scratches into the plaster wall words. And it does it in front of the lampstand so everybody can see it. How many that might freak you out? If while I'm talking, all of a sudden a hand appears and just scratches something into the screen. You, you, well, I can tell you what they did. The color drained from their faces and their knees became so weak that a lot of them had to sit down. And now remember, these are nobles. These are educated. These are wealthy. These are, these are not just party animals. These are people who they've earned a lot in life and they start looking at those words and they can't make head or tails of any of them. They don't know what they are. They don't know what they mean. 
And so now they're really struggling. So I'm actually reading this passage this morning from the English Standard Version. Uh, usually we use the New International Version. There's a, there's a reason. It's one specific phrase. Many translations uh, translate it this way, and I think it's really helpful for our understanding. So Daniel chapter 5, it says, The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Because remember the color gone right out of his face. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, made him chief of all the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit. There's the phrase, an excellent spirit knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve problems, were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Daniel is identified as a man in whom is an excellent spirit. You actually see this phrase show up again in chapter 6, but for different reasons. As it turns out, a person with an excellent spirit is useful to those who are confused or afraid. And a person with an excellent spirit is a problem for those who are corrupted. Daniel's known for having this excellent spirit. So where did it come from? If you know a little of his history, when he was an adolescent, he was actually abducted from his homeland, which was Israel, and taken hundreds of miles to serve the kingdom of Babylon. He was relocated. They changed everything. They changed the language that he spoke, the clothes that he wore, the food that he ate. They even changed his name. But they didn't change him. I want you to think about that. Because in our culture, it feels like we assume that changing your clothes or changing your name, changing something about you actually changes you, that there's something aesthetic in appearance that will make a difference on the inside. And, and Daniel didn't change. He could have been bitter and he could have been resentful because he'd been taken away from his family, from his homeland, all the people that he knew and loved. He could have been corrupted and infatuated. I mean, all the rules were different. Lots of things forbidden in Israel were welcomed and, and included here. And so he could have been all those things. He wasn't. Daniel could have been a, a person who, who went after anything but an excellent spirit. But that's not the choices that he makes. Daniel committed to be the best he could with what he had, where he was. And he didn't ask, how much money will this make me, or how will this increase my status in the kingdom? Often, and when you read through the book of Daniel, there are rewards that are offered to him. And he, he, in this case, Belshazzar offers him a reward and he says, keep your gifts for yourself and give the rewards to somebody else. He's not in it. The, a spirit of excellence isn't about what can I gain out of this. It's doing the best you have where you are. That's what he wants to do. So if, if we use people and we use opportunities for our ends, then we wind up kind of devolving. All, all of our work becomes really about ourself. How will this help me improve my status, improve my resources, improve my opportunities? And that kind of ambition can actually devolve into abuse. There are people who start out as ambitious, but they wind up taking really unfair advantage of others. And our drive can actually drive us to burnout. And our self-sufficiency can actually lead us to self-loathing. We actually become hateful of ourselves because we've seen what we have done and what we have become. There really is a better reason to deploy our gifts and pursue a spirit of excellence. Now, our culture has very different thoughts about things. And uh, so the idea of serving others actually isn't all that high. I know that sometimes people say it is, but, but have you ever thought about this? Why is it that community service is actually a form of punishment? Well, you can go to jail or you can serve this many hours. 
That's how our culture thinks about such things. Our culture is not really known for excellence. It's, it's more known for mediocrity. Uh, and, and more is not necessarily the definition of excellence. More money doesn't mean that it's excellent. More l expensive labels on the clothes that we wear doesn't mean that we are excellent. More square footage in our house is not the definition of excellence. We, that can lead to a lot of mediocrity. People with very impressive capacity in our world hide that because they don't want to be noticed. That's what, that's what our culture is capable of doing to people who have been given incredible gifts. And they just kind of hide out because, because they see what could happen and it makes them anxious. Uh, people break rules, they form alliances with questionable characters, they violate their own values just to get what they want in our world. And if you live like that, you might wind up in palaces with banquet halls surrounded by prominent people, but when the handwriting comes on the wall, color will also drain from your face, and you will have to sit down because your knees are weak, and it's highly likely you won't completely understand the words that have been written. So. What does excellence look like? And I think this story actually unpacks some really interesting clues about what an excellent spirit looks like. And, and, and the first is an excellent spirit brings a fresh perspective to the problems that arise. All the nobles and the king had looked at those words. They couldn't make sense of them. They didn't know what they were or what they meant. And they could have just kept trying or they could have just said, well, since we don't understand it, maybe we're not supposed to know and go on with the rest of their evening or at least dismiss. But they bring someone in who's going to give a different perspective, a fresh perspective. There's three words. The first word is used twice. It's mene. And mene means numbered. So it starts out, mene, mene, it's numbered, numbered. And, and, and then the second word is, is tikal, and it means weighed. And then the third word is pares, which means divided. And Daniel gives context to these words. He tells the king what this means. He says that God has numbered the days of your kingdom, and it's over. That's mene, tikal. God has weighed the sum of your life, and it is not enough. You have wasted what has been given to you. Your impact with all that has been given to you is nothing compared to what God intended for you. You've been weighed, and it's not enough. And then God is dividing your kingdom. Perez, divide. God is dividing your kingdom. He's actually going to divide it among the Medes and the Persians. And he told them, the goblets that you confiscated from the temple and were brought to your drinking party, you actually played games with them and you praised gods of wood and gold and silver and stone. And he said, those gods can't see, those gods can't hear, those gods can't interpret anything. We really need to think about that. So it's fine to be aware of what other people are thinking in our world. I'm not suggesting that we should, should close our ears and our eyes and kind of go through as, as unaware as we possibly can. There's no real benefit to that. But I can tell you this, is that we're not just supposed to constantly parrot whatever someone else in our world has said. God has given every one of us a brain. Let's just do a check in the room this morning. How many God gave you a brain? That's most of you, really. And uh, I'm not sure what God gave the rest of you, but, but brain. And he actually intends for us to use our brain to think for ourselves. I don't think the problem in our world is that there are too many opinions. I think the problem in our world is that there are too few opinions and everybody keeps repeating them over and over and louder and louder. That's what I think is going on in our world. And, and because we hear such loud opinions and so many people repeating them, we actually are afraid to have a thought of our own. An excellent spirit sees different things than other people see. And so there's a fresh perspective. Secondly, is that an excellent spirit craves learning and growing. 
the, the queen actually said about Daniel, he has knowledge and understanding. That's really important, knowledge and understanding. He's a person who's curious. He likes to know how things actually work and how they don't work and why they don't work. He understands that knowledge by itself can be useless or even harmful. It's good to learn information, but we need to know how to apply it. Our culture is known as the age of information, but we are not known as the age of wisdom. True? Yeah. So we have lots of information. I've got more access to more information than I could possibly use. But what does it mean? How do things actually work? A spirit of excellence discovers that. Thirdly, the spirit of excellence discerns God's direction. She said, the queen said, he can interpret dreams. It's very interesting, in the Old Testament and in the ancient world, there were kingdoms, and kingdoms obviously had kings, and God would, on occasion, give kings dreams. He would actually do this. By the way, not just the kings of Israel or followers of him. He would give any king a dream, and these were often archetypal images that they would see that they didn't understand, which made the king have to reach out to people who were wise so that they would come in and provide understanding and counsel for how to respond to what the dream was. And the purpose of the dream was always to position the kingdom so that they would be prepared, they would be preserved, and they would be provided for. That, that's how the, the whole dream system worked doesn't mean that every dream any king had was from God. But when God gave them dreams, the goal was to help bring wise counselors around and discern and position the kingdom. How can we preserve what God has given to us? How can we prepare for what is coming? How can we provide for someone else? That was the goal. And so this is really interesting because discerning God's direction is not the same thing as discerning your personal goals or your personal preferences. I'm not saying that's an in, uh, uh, not a valuable option or something important to do. I think we do need to have a sense of, of goals and things we'd like to accomplish in life. But we also need a sense of God's direction. And here's what I will tell you. There's absolutely no chance, absolutely no chance that you and God think exactly alike. Not possible. So we need to discern his direction. Where is he calling us and why? And a spirit of excellence actually helps us participate in God's plan, not just try to get God to enact our plan. That's the spirit of excellence. Spirit of excellence also takes complex things and makes them understandable. The queen put it like this, explain riddles. Explain riddles. Figure out the puzzling things in life. Breaking things down is not the same as dumbing things down. There, our world is a complicated world. If you've been around here very long, you've probably heard me say this phrase. People are complicated. The gospel is simple, but people are complicated. And so how do we actually make sense of the world we live in? And we have to be able to break things down and make them, make them uh, we're able to take some specific steps, practical things that we can do. A spirit of excellence empowers people and enables them to be able to take action because it helps understand all the complexities that are, go that are going on. So that's what a spirit of excellence does. And the last thing is a spirit of excellence solves problems in a way that everyone wins. This is what the queen says to the king. He solves problems. This is not the same thing as saying everyone gets what they want. Our world right now is very good at identifying what it wants and then employing lots of leverage to get what it wants. But solving problems doesn't mean everybody gets what they want. Solving problems with a spirit of excellence means that we're not in a win-lose situation, but everyone benefits from how this is going to work out. A spirit of excellence finds options that benefit all parties concerned. If you want to become a person of ex with an excellent spirit, you must give attention, you must give attention to your inner world. Where does the spirit of excellence come from? We know what it looks like. Where does it come from? 
And it's not just taking a course about how to pay attention to more details or become more efficient with the use of your time. All of those things are valuable, but they don't produce excellence. They produce efficiency. That's not the same thing. So how? Pay attention to your inner world. Uh, Daniel actually prayed three times every day. This wasn't a religious obligation to him. There actually came a point in his life when it's in chapter six, I mentioned there's a phrase, an excellent spirit. Daniel was being promoted all the, over all the other governors. They were really concerned because this guy paid attention to details and their corrupted efforts would be identified and they would be held accountable for it. So they needed to get rid of him. So they looked for ways to find fault with him. They couldn't find fault with anything. They said, the only way we're gonna get this guy if it has anything to do with his God. And so they tricked the king into passing a law that said no one is allowed for the next number of days to pray to any other God but you. And the king signed it, and that was the law. And Daniel goes, and, he, and same as every other day, he goes into his room, he opens the windows towards Jerusalem, and he gets down on his knees, and he calls on his God. And he's not doing this out of defiance. He's not doing this out of civil disobedience. He's not doing this to prove something or because he's afraid that somehow he'll disappoint God. That's a complete misunderstanding of what is going on. It is how our culture thinks about things. It is not how Daniel thought about it. Daniel understood this. My job has significant responsibility and my decisions actually make a real difference in people's life. And if I don't have wisdom from God, real people are going to suffer and real problems are not going to be solved and real lives are going to be weakened because of it. They need the wisdom of God and the only way I can get it is if I spend time praying with him. Three times every day, one of the most competent people in human history. I'm not exactly exaggerating that. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. will get down on his knees and seek the wisdom of God because so many people depended on that wisdom. That's why he's doing it. He's not, this is not Daniel. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Okay. But that attitude usually doesn't produce a lot of wisdom. So he just keeps praying. And, and he keeps receiving wisdom because real lives are in the balance. Daniel is also a student of scripture. In, in Daniel chapter nine, you read, he's reading the scroll of Isaiah and he comes across the thing that he doesn't understand. And he spends a significant amount of time seeking wisdom from God, trying to, what does this mean and, and how do we live this out? So if you want to be a, a person of, uh, with a spirit of excellence, you, you have to give attention to the inner world. You also want to be a person who accepts that what you do matters. This is the great deception of our age, is that what we do doesn't really matter. It's not that big a deal. Uh, this is one of my life verses. I have two life verses. This is one of them. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What you do matters. You're not wasting your time. You're not wasting your resources. You're not wasting your talent. You're not wasting your ability as long as you work for the Lord. It doesn't just mean doing religious things. You know, well, you know, I, 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 my job isn't in church. That's not what this is about. It's, it's doing your work as though you were doing it for Jesus. So if Jesus were coming to your house for lunch today, what kind of lunch would you prepare him? Would you tell Jesus the peanut butter's in the cupboard, bread's under the counter, help yourself, make yourself to home. I mean, if all you've got is peanut butter, you could still give it to Jesus with a spirit of excellence. Is that not true? Mm hmm. If you were taking a class from Jesus and he was your professor, would you cut the class? Would, would you not do the homework? I mean, if it's actually Jesus, how would you show up? How would you prepare? If you were serving Jesus, how would you actually serve? Here's what I want you to hear about this. The secret of serving with the heart of Jesus is serving other people as though they are Jesus. You want an excellent spirit? 
come to the conclusion that what you do matters and then serve them with the heart of Jesus. Not just checking a box, there I did it, I'm done. But doing it as you would do it to Christ. Your life will not be wasted. It will not be absent of meaning if you live like that. And a spirit of excellence is more than improving efficiency or reducing mistakes. It's more than just building a reputation or financial portfolio. It does far more than that. The spirit of excellence is more than that. A spirit of excellence builds trust. When you live with excellence, people know they can depend on you. Their word means something. They do things that matter. They think for themselves. They can be counted on. There's an absence of trust in our world. And the reason is because there's an absence of a spirit of excellence. And excellence builds others up. It builds trust, but it builds others up. We have to surrender the option of sabotaging things just because they're not our group. It's one of the things that happens in most political societies where there are multi-party options, and that is if my party's not in power, then I want their party to fail. I, this is not meant to criticize anyone in the room in case this is you. You can think about it later. But if I, let's say I got a chance to go to a, a tropical place in February. How many already likes where this is going? Yeah. And it's 82 degrees every day. And the waters are beautiful, and the sand is warm, and the food is good. All right, should we start a, a, a field trip? What do you think? Yeah. And do you know that there are some people that enjoy it more? They enjoy it more if they check the weather back home, and it's absolutely miserable here. <laughs> they do. They go, oh, 16 inches of snow? Ha! I am so glad I'm here. I, you know, I, I even know people that it doesn't even take that. They'll go someplace like that, and when they, when they check the weather back home, and it actually is, we hit 70 degrees, the sun was shining. People in February were outside in their shorts. It will actually ruin some of their vacation for them. This is not a spirit of excellence. <laughs> we want to build others up, and that means that we can't sabotage things or be unhappy for people when things go well for them. We must look for ways to build others up, whether they agree with us or not. Jesus didn't tell us to just build up the people that we like or who are like us. And if you want to be a person of with the spirit of excellence, you must be motivated by love. And I'll ask the worship team to come out. Motivated by love. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, is, is a spiritual gift chapter. It identifies some specific gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And this is what it says at the end of that chapter. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And some people, when they read that, what they think... Paul is saying, this is a replacement for spiritual gifts. If you have love, you don't need the gifts. That's not what he's saying. Eagerly desire. Desire for greater gifts is good. But there is a way to activate those gifts better. The gifts operate more powerfully. And they accomplish more good. And that's when you're motivated and activated out of love. Desire is good. Love is better. And if you want to be a person with an excellent spirit, embrace humility. Humility helps us to learn from our mistakes rather than be defined by them. Your mistake doesn't have to be your identity for the rest of your life. Humility doesn't just allow you to learn from mistakes, it allows you to learn from successes. How many people, when something goes well, that's the mark, and they don't ever try a new or another thing? Humility allows you to ask questions. Humility enables you to pray better prayers for better reasons. 
You may be sitting here and go, oh, Pastor, I'm just not a person of a spirit of excellence. You don't know my history. You don't know where I come from. You don't know what I deal with. And you don't know my, my capacity, my, my aptitudes. Spirit of excellence isn't determined by the place you come from. A spirit of excellence isn't determined by where you are right now. A spirit of excellence is determined when something in your heart turns towards God. God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, that whosoever, anyone, everyone, who believed in him could have eternal life. That is an excellent spirit. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, we are constantly told that in our world, if someone is helped, someone else is left out. Your spirit of excellence helps everyone to benefit from all the good gifts of your grace. Would you help us do that today? You really are good, and we really are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.